John Gotti and the Lutanza heist. Some of you might remember Martin Scorsese's mob classic, Goodfellas, starring Ray Liotta, who played infamous mafia turncoat Henry Hill, who tells the story of the famous Lutanza heist, where a group of gangsters stole around $6 million in cash and valuables from the Kennedy Airport in New York City. The film also co-starred Robert De Niro, who played Irish gangster Jimmy the Gent Burke, who was connected with the Italians, as well as Joe Pesci, who played the role of Tommy De Simone, another Italian gangster who was part of the Gambino family. Although the Goodfellas movie was told from Henry Hill's point of view, according to his book, The Lutanza Heist, written after the movie but before his death in 2012, the movie really only highlighted certain parts of the heist, and there were certain details that never made it into production. One of those details includes John Gotti's role in the heist. In the movie After the Heist Goes Down, Stax Edwards, who is portrayed by Samuel L. Jackson, is whacked in his apartment for failing to get rid of the van used during the heist. And because the mobsters were getting rid of all loose ends, which is why so many gangsters who were involved in the heist were also clipped. But according to the book, certain details were left out and a few were changed. For starters, the movie never mentioned that Stax Edwards was actually supposed to bring the van to John Gotti's auto wrecking yard in Flatlands, Brooklyn. The car was to be crushed and disposed of, but Stax never arrived. Instead, he drove from a warehouse in Maspeth, Queens, where Gotti arranged for the van to be taken so they could switch the earnings to a getaway car. But Stax went directly to his girlfriend's house, where he was said to have gotten drunk and snorted cocaine until he ultimately fell asleep, never getting the van to the auto wreckers. Instead, the van was parked in front of a fire hydrant where it was discovered by police. According to the book, Lewis Werner, Lutanza shipping clerk, who was also a degenerate gambler, and owed bookmaker Marty Krugman $20,000, which he didn't have, so instead offered Krugman the lowdown on how he could steal millions from the Lutanza cargo building where Werner worked and in exchange, his $20,000 debt would be forgiven. Krugman then took the plan to Henry Hill, who took it to Jimmy the Gent Burke. Burke took the details of the plan to Paul Vario, depicted as Paul Cicero in the movie, to get an advance on money to carry the plan out. With the seed money now supplied, Burke put together a crew consisting of Tommy D. Simone, Louis Roastbeef Cabora, Angelo Sepe, Paolo LaCastri, Joe Manry, Robert Frenchy McMahon, and his son Frankie Burke. On December 11, 1978, a team of masked men armed with pistols stormed into the Lutanza cargo building and held Lutanza employees hostage for 55 minutes where they cleaned out the valuables and made their escape. No employees were hurt and the money still has never been recovered and nobody was ever successfully convicted for their role in the heist which took place over 30 years ago. The stolen van left outside Stax Edwards' girlfriend's apartment was noticed by authorities because it was the same make and model as described by Lutanza employees who says it was the same Ford Econoline he noticed outside the building the night of the robbery. December 11th at 3.32 a.m. as planned, the van was parked waiting outside the Lutanza terminal and was spotted by a cargo agent named Kerry Whalen. Whalen went to investigate and he was pistol whipped and snatched into the van. The men took his wallet and threatened to harm his family if he didn't cooperate, so he did. Another agent who was investigating the commotion outside walked to the loading dock where he was ambushed by six armed men with ski masks and the men entered the building, rounding up the remaining employees and placing them in a break room. The men ordered one of the cargo agents to call their senior cargo agent, Rudy Elric, who Werner had previously told them was the only one with the codes to get into the vault. Elric arrived believing he was there to fix a technical problem and was met by the masked men, who then forced him to get them through the vault's complicated two-door system which the robbers were informed had to be done correct or they'd never get out without first being surrounded by Port Authority police. The men took 40 different parcels and loaded them into the Fort Econoline before taking Elric to be locked in the break room with the other employees and instructed them not to make any calls until 4.30 a.m. 
giving the men a 15 minute head start on police. It took Burke's crew 64 minutes to pull off the biggest heist in US history, escaping with around five million in cash and another million or so in jewels. Everything went according to plan, but a crew is only as good as its weakest link. Two days after the heist on December 13th, police were called to Canarsie, Brooklyn after receiving calls about a van parked in a no parking zone matching the description of the van being driven by the Lutanza thieves, according to Lutanza employees. Fingerprint experts were dispatched to the scene where they recovered the prints of Parnell or Stax Edwards, but Jimmy the Gent had already had Edwards whacked for not following through with the plan. According to different reports, Stax was supposed to bring the van directly to John Gotti's auto wreck yard, located either in Brooklyn or some say New Jersey, after transferring the stolen merchandise to another vehicle in Massbeth, Queens. Instead, Stax, who had been smoking weed, went to his girlfriend's house, leaving the Econoline, which was heavily being searched for, in a no parking zone, while he and his girlfriend got drunk and did cocaine until they passed out major mistake on Stack's part. Jimmy the Gent became paranoid over the heist after that crucial mistake and began taking men out who could implicate him in masterminding the heist. After sending Tommy DeSimone and Angelo Sebe to take out Stax Edwards who was the first to go, Burke ultimately took out almost everyone who was involved in the heist, including his own son Frankie Burke. Although nobody knows whether it was Burke himself who killed his son or if he had an associate do it. The only person ever convicted for their part in the heist was Lewis Werner, the original degenerate gambler who proposed the heist plans in the first place. He was convicted in May of 1979 and served 15 years in prison. As most of you know from the movie, Henry Hill was arrested for drug trafficking in 1980, where he ultimately went on to become an FBI informant and flipped on Jimmy Burke out of fear of going to prison or fear that Burke would have him whacked out of fear of cooperation because Hill and Burke were working together in the narcotics business. Years later, according to an FBI informant, he stated that only two people received kickups from Burke who took most of the players out involved in order to not have to pay them for their caper. One of the men being Paul Vario, who was said to have received $450,000 and the other was none other than Gambino boss John Gotti, who is said to have received $200,000 from Burke. 